been talking for the last few uh, weeks uh, about changing the narrative of certain situations and circumstances in, in our lives. And uh, we've been looking at changing the narrative of how it is when we're alone. You know, often we think of being alone as being a negative, but if we're alone and we can get it right, do you know what? That can be such a strong point for us as Christians, where, where we're not feeling isolated, but we're drawing on power from God to do something when we're alone. Not just that, but we also talked about growing up. Turn to the person next to you and say, grow up. Grow up. Say it with a real smile on your face, though, and not offend anyone. Let's grow up. And look at how we need to mature in the faith as Christians. We don't stay as immature believers, but we mature and grow up so that God can use us. And I want to read, hopefully it's going to come up here on the screen if I do this, from John's Gospel, chapter 12, verses 23. It says this, Jesus replied, the hour has come for, for the Son of Man to be glorified. What a great verse to start off. You know what? The hour has come for the Son to be glorified. We think that is a time to start celebrating, isn't it? But let's keep reading. Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it. Well, anyone who hates their life in this world would keep, will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honour the one who serves me. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. This morning's message, what I want to speak to you about, is when adversity becomes an asset. When adversity in your life and my life becomes an asset. Definition of adversity is this, unfavourable fortune or fate, a condition marked by misfortune, calamity or distress. Adversity we associate with hardship, with difficulty, with anger or disaster. And if you're anything like me, usually we want to avoid it at all costs. We want to stay away from adversity as much as we can. But I'm going to tell you this morning, each and every one of us needs a little bit of adversity in our lives. Each and every one of us doesn't always need things to go our way, but we need situations sometimes, and this is strange, sometimes to come against us so that we know who we are in Christ. It's only when things come against us we discover what is inside, what God has put there, and it's through adversity and pressure and things heating up in our lives that we realize where our faith really is. Say to the person next to you, a little, a little bit of the bad is not too bad. In these verses that we read, Jesus is talking about his death. He's talking about what he's going to suffer. He's talking about that although he's going to be glorified, he is coming to the point where he's going to first be killed. And although he's about to die, it says that the seed of that action, the seed of him dying, will actually produce much fruit for the kingdom of God. Just like Jesus was laying down his life on the cross in that time 2,000 years ago, he was telling his disciples as well, but just as I've laid, my down, laid down my life, the time is going to come as well where you're going to have to lay down your lives in order to serve me. And to the Spirit, we believe today that we have to turn away and we have to lay down our lives for certain things to come to pass. We have to say no to our flesh. We have to say no to things of the past. We have to lay down our agendas to take up everything that God has for us. Jesus said that it was for this very reason that he had come. The very reason was to die. It wasn't just to perform the miracles. It wasn't just to come to a virgin. It wasn't just to, to do all that he had done. It was he came to die. And I love it how it says this. So rather than saying, Father, take this adversity away from me, he was actually saying, this 
adversity that I'm about to face in going to the cross is actually going to become an asset. It's actually going to become an asset in the kingdom of God and for all the believers to come. Adversity, just as it was for Jesus, can become an asset for you and for me in our lives. A little while ago, I went and got in my car after a few weeks of not driving it. I turned the key in the ignition and it just clicked over and nothing started at all. I tried it a few more times and I realized that the battery had gone. I opened up flat dead, it makes no difference, it wasn't working. <laughs> it wasn't working, I opened up the bonnet, got another car just to come up in front of it. And I connected, I had to connect jump leads. Anyone had to use jump leads before? Yeah, 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 good. You all know how to use jump leads? Sort of, sort of. Didn't get straight on the phone to AA or anyone like that, or your mum or your dad or a neighbour or anything like that, no? Did it well done. And then and anyway, I got the, the leads out of the back of the car and the red lead from the you know the positive charge on one battery to the positive charge on the other battery, and then the black lead to the negative charge on the one battery to the to the negative charge in, in the other car. And you know, it turned the key start revving the other car up and brum, 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 and after a while it's you know the other one we try it and then it clicks over and it at last it comes into life. Brum, it roars into life. What was dead it is now alive. And I wonder sometimes, isn't it strange that in order to get a car battery to work, you need a negative. In order to get a car battery to work, you think that an engine like that, you think that Ford or Vauxhall or whatever else you might have, Toyota, BMW, Tesla, whatever other design, would manage to have designed a car by now that only required positivity. But even your car, as you turn it, needs a negative in it to get going. And I'm the kind of person that is cup half full, definitely. You know, I'm not that pessimistic. I, I you know, I, I, I look at the bright side of life. I find people who are negative a little bit nauseous, I've got to be honest. And you know, I, I, I'm, a car, I'm a glass half full kind of person. And I, I'm amazed that even Jesus said that adversity and negativity was what he needed at this time in order to fulfill his destiny. In order for Jesus to come and do what he did on the cross, it wasn't all about the good times. It was also about having some negatives in there. And you and I, in our lives, do you know we need some negatives, not just positives? It, we need some thou shalt not, not just thou shalt. When we need some negative situations where things don't go our way all the time, and we discover what is inside, negativity can be a good thing from time to time because if we realize what is inside of us. And just in those verses, as it said there in John chapter 12, let me just read a little bit of it again. Very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. I was thinking of, uh, hopefully that was going to flick over. I was thinking, oh yeah, this is another quote I came across from a theologian. He's also the Tottenham manager. Says that either you're going through a storm or it's coming. For a Tottenham manager, storms come along very regularly. But, but, but in other words, either you're going through a storm or it's around the corner. Either you're going through adversity at the moment or it's not far uh, away in, in our lives. Let me go back to that verse there. I'll just leave that there. And I thought of a seed. Do you know what? A seed is planted in, in the ground. A seed has to fall away from its plant, from the flower, and it's going to be inserted into the soil in order for it to grow. And as that seed goes into the ground, you know what? It's surrounded by mud. It's surrounded by soil. It's overcome with darkness. But a seed goes in the ground. And if you can imagine being a seed, come on, get a little bit imaginative with me this morning. Imagine being a seed and thinking, oh man, there's just more muck coming on me. Oh man, there's just more, more darkness that seems to surround me. Oh man, there's just more, more, more soil that this, this farmer keeps pouring on my life and it seems dark and dark and dark. 
And, but you know what? There's something in that seed that, that has DNA in it that God wove into the DNA of that seed that says when the darkness comes on it and when it's planted in the, in the ground and when soil surrounds it, something in that seed starts to grow. Even more darkness, more soil, more muck comes on it, but it still starts to grow. The dirt has dirtied it, the mud has muddied it, and surely it is dead. It's all alone. All hope has been lost for that small seed. But I want to say this morning, it's not dead. There's something exceptional about a small seed that falls to the ground and is buried. It has DNA in it that can grow in the darkness. It has DNA in it that can grow in the muck. It has DNA in it that can grow in the soil of the land. The laws of science which God wrote say that it is not the end for that seed. There is DNA in the seed that although it is surrounded by mess and darkness, that these are the conditions for rebirth and new life. The grain must fall into the ground and die that it may produce Fruit. And do you know why it's very similar for you and I today? We go through storms in life, we go through adversity, where it just seems like, God, how much more can I take? God, it doesn't seem like a breakthrough is coming. God, it seems like darkness is everywhere. It seems like there's no change. But you know, if you stay planted, if you stay in belief, if you know that there's something on the inside of you that God has put there and God has called you to, do you know what? You can overcome all the darkness and the soil that is around you and grow new life. Do you believe that? Good, I'm glad there are two of us here this morning. That are faith filled and going for it. I came across some examples of seed about how, how some seeds are dispersed. And you know, some seeds, they're, they're blown from their plants. Some of you know far more about gardening than I do, so, so correct me if I'm wrong. But some seeds, you know, they'll be blown by the wind. They'll, they'll be blown and they'll, they'll spread right across a field. They'll, they'll go right across oceans and seas and they'll blow plants on a new land. That's how they, they move. That's how they get about. That's how their species are propagated and reproduced. Some species, they're dispersed by water, they're carried over long distances by river and um, through oceans. Some attach themselves to the, to the fear of different animals. And as the seeds fall on the animals, a sheep or whatever it might be, those animals will carry those seeds to another field, to, to another area, to, to another country where they'll be pollinated there. And I came across one other method of pollination and seed disbursement. And I know it's a Sunday morning and we're all looking forward to, to dinner. But one of the ways that seeds are transferred is by animal digestion and excretion. Isn't that true? And do you know what? They're animal. They might eat some seeds on the floor and it goes down into the stomach and it goes into the mess and it comes out of the mess the other end and it moves across country and it can go anywhere. Do you know what? I know that's a little bit of a horrible example this morning, but the only thing that you'll remember is probably that example. That the seed, although it looks like maybe it's dead and it's going through the ringer and it looks like all well, hope is lost, do you know what? You could be, it maybe just looks like this mess on a loved one's life at the moment and it doesn't seem like any change. Maybe it looks like there's this mess in your life at the moment and it's hard to change it. Do you know what? Those environments sometimes are the best environments for producing a harvest. They're the best environments because out of death can come new life. In the Old Testament, the family of Jacob had moved down to Egypt because of Joseph and because there was famine in the land where they were. And they moved down to Egypt and resettled in the land of Goshen. And you have the 12 tribes of, of Jacob, his sons. And they're there and they set up, and after a while they start to get stronger in number, stronger in strength, um, more uh, richer in assets and acquisitions, and they, they, they're there in the land of Egypt, and the Egyptians get a little bit worried about them. The Egyptians get a little bit worried about these people who have moved into their land, and they start 
to subjugate them. They start to, to keep them as slaves in order so that they don't get too many and don't get out of hand, to limit their numbers. And they put pressure on them to work. They treat them as slaves. They bind them and they keep them under hard harsh labor conditions. And you would think that in that environment, they would dwindle and die out. You would think that because they are being kept as slaves and because they are treated to harsh working environments and they're in a foreign land, that surely they would get less able, less well, and be on the decline. But I want to turn and put a verse up on the, I'll read it to you and put some of it up on the screen now. But it says this in Exodus chapter 1 verse 12 about the children of Israel while, while they were in the land of Egypt. It says this. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and worked them ruthlessly. The more they were oppressed, I think I've got it there, the more they multiplied and spread. And sometimes we think that adversity is going to be the end of us. And adversity is going to be a liability because we're not going to make it through. Adversity is a negative because we're, we're going to be under pressure, we're going to collapse, and we're going to cave in. But you know what? Adversity can be an asset. Adversity in your life can become an asset for you because you can grow in that time. The more they were oppressed, the more, the more they multiplied and spread. We need some Christians nowadays that are going to say, even though I'm going through the trial, I will worship God. We need some Christians these days that say, even though I'm unwell, I will still worship him. We need some Christians these days who are going to say, even though they left me, I will worship him. We need some Christians these days who will say, even though I'm the only one, I will worship him. We need some Christians these days to say, even though the pastor gets on my nerves, I'm going to worship Jesus. We need some Christians these days to say, even though I'm unsure of the future and what it holds, I'm going to submit to him and worship Jesus. We need some Christians these days to say, even though I'm in a foreign land, I'm going to worship Jesus. We need some Christians these days to say, even though I don't feel like it, I'm going to worship Jesus, even in the midst of adversity. I want to take you to a place in these next few moments, not to the Wizard of Oz, but to the land of us. For those of you who know the book of Job, Job was from the land called us, southeast of the Jordan River. He lived there, it says, a blameless life. It says that he was rich. Scripture lists the animals that Job had, not in the tens, but in the hundreds and thousands category. He had ten children, received blessings from God. But you know what? We read about Job that things turned around for him. Once upon a time in Job's life, his life was like that kernel of wheat that symbolized the blessing of God. It was full. It was blessed. It was prosperous. It was joyous. It was peaceful. It was content. It was like that wheat that was full, a kernel of wheat that was full. But do you know why it says that Satan asked God for permission to remove all that God had given him? And the strangest thing is, but God allowed it. God said, okay, you can take it. And Satan was sure at this moment in time when he would take everything from Job that now he would curse God. Now he would turn around and say, God, I'm done with you. But Job didn't say that. He kept, he stayed righteous, stayed following God. And in those moments where Satan had taken everything from him, I'm sure for Job it felt like all the muck was coming on his life. It felt like darkness was surrounding him, like a seed that is pushed down into the ground. It felt like he was all alone and by himself. It felt like God had abandoned him. But Job had been planted like a seed in the ground. And although this mess came on him from not nothing of his own doing, but because of what was going on in heaven, do you know what? Job must have thought, God, where are you? Where, where are you in all this back? 
Where are you in all this mess? Why, why, why? He was getting covered in the soil of, of darkness, but he was being planted for a rebirth. He was being planted for a change and a re, 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 re coming to life for him and his loved ones. And I think many of us today can relate to Job's situation. But I wonder how many of us can replicate his response <laughs> to his situation. Many of us can say, hey, yeah, I've been through some stuff. But how many of us can replicate Job's response when he was surrounded like a seed in the ground by darkness? I want to say this morning that adversity becomes an asset when you understand that Satan's remit is limited. Do you know what, in Job's life, Satan did not have a free reign. God gave him certain permissions that he could, that he could act in and on. It says in Job 1.12, that this is God speaking to Satan. Everything Job has is in your hand, but on the man himself, you must not lay a finger. God gave him certain permissions, but Satan didn't have the last word. You have to understand in your life, if you want your adversity to become an asset, that Satan's power is limited. And is only allowed to go <coughs> a certain distance. <coughs> also, if you want to realise that, we make adversity an asset in our lives. We've got to be in a place where we don't blame God for what has gone on. Job 1 verse 22, it says this, it says this about Job. In all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. Now, how many of us just put the question to God and say, God, how could you do this? God, why would you do this? I think God realises our weakness and he understands why we ask that question. But can we stay in a position of faith and say, hey, I don't understand it all. But the Lord give us and the Lord take us away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. If we want adversity to become an asset in our lives, then we have to be willing to take the good and the bad in our stride. The good and the bad in our stride. Job 2 verse 10 says this, shall we accept good from God and not trouble? If we're going to have your people who keeps adversity, it makes adversity an asset, we're going to have to stay close to God. That's what Job did. Job 23 10 says this, but he knows the way I take. When he has tested me, I will come forth like gold. My feet have closely followed his steps. I have kept his ways without turning aside. Hey, I want to say to adversity, stay close to God. To times of grief, stay close to God. To times of uncertainty, stay close to God. If we want adversity in our life to become an asset, we've got to realize that we don't have all the answers. You, know, you can meet some people and you just think, man, they've got it all figured out. They don't need anything more. They've got all the answers. At the right time, hey, run. You, you should be God. <laughs> you, should be, you should be in charge. But you know what? We've got to stay in a place of humility that says, hey, sometimes we can't provide you the answers. Sometimes we need to take a step of faith and a step of trust that says, God, I don't understand it all but I'm willing to trust you with it. That's what Job said in 24, he said this about his own words. Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful to understand. If we're gonna be a people that turns adversity into an asset, we've gotta be a people who says that my redeemer lives even in the hardest of circumstances. Even in the darkest of valleys, hold on. To them. You don't know what's coming, you don't know what's around the corner, but you know that you know that you know that Jesus lives, and no one can take that away from you. People may come and go, but they can't take the fact that Jesus lives. And you might not have it all figured out, it might not make much sense to you now, but your Redeemer still lives. If I asked you this morning to hold up your hands, I wonder how many ladies across this place might have something sparkly on their fingers. Come on, let's have a look. Hands up just for a minute. I found some interesting things out about diamonds the last few days. Anyone got any diamonds on? Come on. No, no, husbands, come on. Put your fingers out, gents. Put your fingers out. 
I admit this about diamonds. Don't they look so sparkly? Don't they look so precious? But diamonds are, are usually millions of years old. They know as the hardest um, substance on earth, made up of only one metal, carbon. They can, apparently, you can get diamonds in every colour. The word diamonds derives from the Greek word adamas, meaning indomitable or invincible. Indomitable or invincible. In other words, you cannot break that diamond on your finger. You cannot break that diamond bracelet. You won't be able to break that necklace if he ever buys it for you, women. But they're formed deep within the earth's surface, deep within the earth's mantle through a complex process that involves extreme pressure and extreme temperature over millions of years. And the pressure can reach up to 10,000 atmospheric units and the temperature can exceed over 2,200 degrees Fahrenheit. That's pretty hot. That's pretty hot. And it's these conditions that are necessary to transform the element of carbon into the sparkling diamond that you see in the shop windows. What I'm trying to say that is that it's extreme adversity that the carbon goes through in order to become something sparkling and something shiny. Years of being broken down, years of being blasted, years of being heated up to temperatures that we just cannot imagine. And if a diamond was here this morning, if one of you ladies actually had a diamond with you this morning, I think that diamond would speak. That diamond would have words to say to us this morning that it's been through a lot. It's been through a lot in its life. It's been through some hardship. It's been through some setbacks and adversity. But the adversity that it went through made it into the asset that it is today. Made it into the asset that is sparkling and is gleaming and is worth so, so much. The prized possession, the prized asset came from years of adversity and pressure and extreme temperature in an environment that it didn't understand, an environment that, that wasn't pleasant, but it made it through the other side. Isaiah 43 verse 2 says this, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. Come on, let's just bow our head and pray for a few, head and pray for a few minutes. Heavenly Father.